Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to uh, Rochester Square here today for Word Vancouver, which is always festival. I get to see you. Yeah, um, we get to see you here as well. Um, I, uh, I certainly want to thank the uh, Musqueam Squamish to play with two people for. Uh, uh, I want to give that acknowledgement. Uh, they have a long tradition of storytelling. We have a, a little tradition of storytelling we're working on. It's not as great as theirs, but uh, we're, we're, everybody's doing their best in this day and age. Um, uh, we're going to we're here with Eve Lazarus today. This is a treat because I don't get to see you all the time because you live uh, off in another city called North Vancouver. I've never visited there. Across the bridge or anything, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, we've we've had we've had some talks like this before. Uh, but we're so if you've seen us together talk, hopefully we'll get into some new territory here as well. But if you haven't seen Eve and I discuss. In particular, your book, uh, before, or your books. Um, that's what we're going to get into today. We're also going to talk a little bit, I, in my own small, humble way. I've written a couple of things myself, don't you know? And uh, uh, and because often, even I compare notes or uh, sometimes work off each other. Sometimes not knowing it at first, because sometimes we cover we cover the, cover the same territory. Um, we'll get maybe a little bit of some stuff or, or something comparative that maybe helps us. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, excellent. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I joked around a little bit earlier today, saying uh, with this, this hour of the day, uh, if it's acceptable to talk about murder and whatnot, or having you know a little bit of murder for brunch uh, and whatnot, and uh, sometimes you have to have a, bit of a, a dark sense of humor when dealing with some of this, or just for your own relief. Um, but this is a serious subject, and sometimes, uh, sometimes I, I don't know how you feel, Eve. Sometimes crime in itself gets treated sometimes a little too flippantly, where at the end of the day, as your book really indicates, there's family members and people who have to live with this legacy of a, of a family member that's, that's uh, that has been murdered. And there, I can't think of any worse specter to, or a shadow to follow you throughout your life uh, with this thing. And in your, in, maybe you can speak about it just in some of your interviews or dealings with some of these subject matters. Um, What's been what's been your impression of that? You know, like you always, you you do have to be. This is a serious subject you're getting at. And what do you sometimes keep in mind in dealing with the sensitivities of speaking to family members? Uh, yeah, I've noticed in the last couple of years, in particular, as true crime podcasts have just exploded, mm -hmm. and we're getting all these crazy things like uh, mimosas, true crime, or I can't think of other titles. And I mean, I do. A Podcast as well, but it, it just seems to be they've taken the families and the victims out of out of these shows. It's just become pure entertainment, and I find that really interesting. And I guess I started this years and years ago. I kind of fell into it. I was writing two books, and um, it's writing actually a sensational Hoover and kind of crazy idea that us has uh, a genealogy. Or like a person, and it was telling the story of the house through the people that lived there and the events that took place. And I wrote a chapter about murders in the houses, and it was just uh, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on each one. I, I got a couple of people who freaked me from Vancouver Police Museum, like the Falls murder, and uh, sort of got a bit interested in that, um, in the history of it as well. The Falls were murdered in 58, they were murdered in Vancouver. And I just wrote that up and wrote up several other murders. And I just really wanted to find out more about the victims. I, I found it was just not enough to write about this brutal murder. I wanted to, to know more about the victims. And one of the uh, people that came up was called Evelyn Roche. And she was a 39 year old, too. And when I'd written about her, in sensational Vancouver in the house that she was built in, which was just down from Van Tech on 7th and 10th Victon. I just wondered what happened to her kids. You know, it said that she just married again, uh, that they just moved into a house. And um, after sensational Vancouver came out, I started digging into it. And that actually became a cover of Cold Face Vancouver in, in 2015. And I found the two children who were there. Right, and they told me the story, and that just intrigued me to be able to tell the story. And and I realized talking to them that even though 
been 60 odd years since this had happened, that they never stopped asking. They never stopped wanting to, to get answers. And so every story in the book in Cold Case Bank Pro worked very, very closely with the families. And I got to know them really well and, and to care about them. So this is a really roundabout way of saying that whenever I'm writing something, I think something or podcasting something, I think the families are listening to this or could be listening to this. Am I comfortable with what they're hearing? And I think we talked about this as journalists too. In journalism school or when you're working for a newspaper, you're always told never show the source your copy before it goes to print. And... When I started doing this, I completely threw that on its ear and, set, and worked very closely with the family. And I know in, in the case of Lindsay Nichols, she was um, a 14-year-old girl that went missing in 1993, I think it was, from Comox. And I worked with her mother. I worked with her father, who was an RCMP officer, I worked, who was split up. Um, and I worked with her sister. And I think showed the multiple, multiple drafts. And it just turned out to be such a stronger case. And, and the same with one of the first stories in Cold Case, Vancouver. It was um, Jenny Conrod. She was a war worker in 1944. She was 24 years old. She worked at the shipyards and they did the grain elevators. Uh, and she was murdered and her body was dumped above the highway in West Vancouver. And it came out later that she was an unmarried mother. And the press just brutalised this poor girl. The papers her parents didn't know that she'd had a baby, she'd hidden that from them. And basically, police and the press just blamed her for a murder. And when I started writing about this, I had heard about it through the Vancouver archives. Diane Ede had doing his book, and I said, you know, I've just come across this photo album from 1944, and it says Jenny Conroy. And it's got um, all these pictures of the family and everything. Are you interested? And I said, oh, my God, yes. And jumped in the car and went down and took a look. And because Cold Case Vancouver was with my editor, you know, I thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this. So I wrote a blog post. And weirdly, the next day, his niece was with me and told me that Jane's daughter was like, well, in New Zealand, like children. And was, you know, after 70 years, desperate for answers her mother's unsolved murder. Um, so I called her and said, oh, I'd love to get this case in the book. And she said, well, you know, you've got a week. <laughs> you know what that's like. You know, most of the chapters take months and months of yeah. research and work. Anyway, we did it. And I ended up writing this chapter with Mary's daughter and Mary's niece. And um, I thought it was one of the strongest in the book. So long way of saying, yeah, I, I really, whenever possible, try to collaborate with the families and make sure that they're comfortable with what is coming out. Yeah, and uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, to backtrack, I didn't necessarily uh, introduce uh, Eve and I what our backgrounds are necessarily, but uh, you have a background in journalism, primarily. I have a background in history, uh, academic, uh, whatnot, and, and, uh, and just things that I've written about in terms of city history, municipal history, and whatnot. Um, and that's an always an interesting concept, the idea where you're not supposed to show, uh, you know, what you've written until, but I've broken that role too, uh, certainly in the case, and I don't know if it's if it's ever been something that's presented to you in that way that you think, the only way I'm going to get these people to talk to me is if I give it, look, I'll, I'll tell you, and I've said this to some people, and I've said this to police who don't want to go on record, to uh, active criminal gangsters who don't necessarily want the press, but are they read one of my books and they sort of see where I'm coming at. They're okay to talk to me. Don't use my name, Aaron, but or don't use it. You know, if you use the story, everybody's going to know it's going to come from me. That's a, uh, you know, uh, that could be an issue for people. Uh, but presenting it as, look, before this goes to the, the printers, I'll let you read everything I've written about. And, and uh, sometimes that seems like, I don't know what rules are breaking journalistically or ethically or, or literally, you know, in that sense, because you're never going to, you're going to have people come back and sometimes, the, the benefit, I think, is sometimes people say, oh, you've, you're from different events here, and it was just for that detail, so you get the story right. Um, but sometimes that's the only way, it feels like sometimes people can talk. And I, I've told this to you, and, and I don't mean it as a snub, I never tell people I'm a journalist. Uh, going, I, do, I, and I don't have the journalism background that you do. I've 
certainly worked in journalism, but my roots are as a historian. So I sometimes think because journalists in this day and age get sometimes across the board a bad rap. I don't want to talk to a journalist. Uh, there's that fear. Um, well, I, I sometimes try and placate people's fears, saying, look, I'm not looking for a gotcha moment as a journalist. I'm trying to make you or anybody else look back here. I'm just trying to find out what happened, um, which in the end is what any journalist, historian, any writer should be looking for the truth, obviously. And it's just how we go about it is, is interesting. But is that, has that presented itself to you in, that you've been able to open people up a little bit by saying just that, that you'll show them the manuscript or, you, or you'll tell them what you've written about them just to get the detail right of anything else? Yeah, I think it's a comfort level, yeah. and you're right. People think it's a gotcha moment. Yeah. That, um, and people think, I, I think, that we're, we're controversial. We're always looking for, that, for controversy, and that is just not true. We're looking for the truth, well, at least I think with us um, and, and with our history backgrounds and so forth. We're looking for the truth. And, yeah, and if, if, if I've got a detail wrong or, God forbid, spell the name wrong, you don't want to see that happen in the book uh, or anywhere. Uh, and, and I'm corrected. I mean, that, that's terrific. I'm really happy about that. And the weird thing I've noticed, though, I've probably noticed this as well, when you, you write about horrendous things, very, very personal things, and, and maybe the worst thing that someone's ever gone through in their life, and they'll look it over and they'll say, you said we had an oak tree in the backyard. That's an elm. Could you change that? And everything else is fine. Uh, yeah, thanks. And yeah. It's always yeah. a surprise. How comfortable that they are once they've seen that, and you know, occasionally they don't want that information out, and that's okay. It's out. Yeah, certainly. I, it, in the case of uh, a book of Michael Last Gang in Town, I was interviewing uh, some former and I guess current. These guys never leave. Clark Park gang members, and some of these people have Hell's Angels affiliations. And um, uh, I got a call one day on a Sunday. It's a quick anecdote here. Uh, to uh, I was supposed to do an interview with somebody. And uh, about two o'clock, about one forty-five, phone rings, and I think it's the guy calling. And he says, "Well, tell me about the tell me about the book." And I sort of told him the preamble. I just thought maybe he wanted a refresher, so I said, "Well, it's about this and that, and that's why I'm looking into this." And I was hoping to find out about that and track down this person if they're still around or, or whatnot. And uh, I realized that the person I thought I was supposed to be talking to, this was a different person. And he wanted to know exactly what I was writing about, and poking around asking these questions. And he was obviously with, uh, with the organization of uh, gentlemen that ride motorcycles uh, for a living quite a bit. And you see them around their vests and whatnot. I don't want to go further than that. And, uh, you know, he said, well, the thing is, Aaron, there's lots of people still alive from those days. Some sensitive issues sometimes. So we'd prefer if you didn't write about two people. And they named the two people didn't recognize the names at first. I should have recognized one of them. And I didn't want to agree to anything. I didn't know who this guy was as much as I thought I was sort of being threatened to not write about some things. I thought, well, I, I think the stuff I'm writing about is kind of before these guys, I, you know, which it, in a way it was. But he says, well, that's fine. fine. And, then he, and, he, and then he, it was weird. It sort of pivoted because it's an interesting subject there. Very, very, uh, those were crazy times back then. He goes, you're that kid that wrote the Commodore book, right? Oh, yeah. And he goes, oh, I really enjoyed that. And I thought, these guys are around reading my books in the clubhouse or something? I thought it was the strangest thing ever. Yeah, did they go to the library? Did you know, library card? You know, like, yeah. So, and uh, he, talked to me. he actually gave me some suggestions, uh, which was weird. And, uh, and then he kind of wound up the phone call. I said, well, Aaron, good luck. You know, uh, I look forward to reading the book when it, come out, when it comes out. But he said it in a way, I still remember the tone, I can't imitate it. He looked forward to the book when it came because he seemed legitimately. He says, "That's an that's an amazing time in Vancouver history." You know, he was just talking about the whole period back then. But he also was looking forward to reading it and making sure those two names were in the book. So I hang up and I immediately called one of the Clark Park gang people I'd been talking to, who was sort of helping facilitate some of this, introducing me to people. And I said, "Hey, man, I think you just got threatened on the phone to not write about a couple of people here. I didn't recognize the name." And uh, it turns out one of the names was the head of the chapter of the East End organization which i will leave out and uh he said aaron don't worry but look i talked to them and i said i i told them what we we're doing because i thought it's better to tell them what we're talking about rather than us be called to a sit down and have some trouble with it later everything's fine uh but the reason why they don't want to mention some of these people is because they're active members and that organization thanks to levine books and some of those uh organized crime books that came out back east that show their logos and stuff like this they feel if you're going to talk about them, 
then you're going to owe the money. So they don't want to send a guy with a baseball bat down to your publishers with an invoice for 10 grand or something like this. So it's, we, I just want to tell them we're all, and I, I kind of breathe a sigh of relief, but I also thought, God, I, I can't imagine, you know, Brian and Robert at Arsenal Press responding to a biker with, you know, with a baseball bat uh, showing up wanting to get disappearance on, on some. Um, so in, in the end, it, it, it worked out quite well and it was fine. And uh, th those people actually weren't so central to the story. They were a little too young and they were kind of were aware and, and were around them. But I managed to sort of steer. When, the book came, when that book came out, I, I thought, for sure, I'd have, gonna have some, somebody, either on the police or some of the organized crime people that were involved. And the funny thing that Christmas, I, I got a call from, uh, I got a call from Ryan Honeyborn, the retired police officer, said, geez, Aaron, everybody, every retired cop in the city got your book for Christmas. Everybody loves it. I get calls, uh, and, I thought, geez. and then I got a call from one of the old gang members that every retired or active biker in the city got your book for Christmas, and they all love it. So somehow I managed to get the Titanic through the iceberg field, but I, I was worried about it. But the only way I could really do it is try and be honest with people and, and, and to say that exactly what you're saying. Just saying, look, I'll let you. And, and it was helpful, too, because those guys got back to me saying, well, some of these, it's not the same incident, or just for your clarity. You know, but everybody was fairly, well, in fact, I think sometimes in the aftermath, some people were disappointed they weren't mentioned. You know, like, because some of these, everybody has an ego to a certain extent. Um, it, it was a funny, it's a funny thing writing a book or working on it. What I want to ask you even, it's such a broad question, but especially in the wake of um, Cold Case Vancouver, your decision to do Cold Case BC, and I wonder if we can anticipate a Cold Case Canada at some point, or you're going to be... See, yeah, yeah. Uh, but how do, you, how do you do your research? How, what's the first step? Are there... Obviously, you start broad and you move in, and, and uh, has the blog been helpful? Has things like that? I'm curious basically how Right from the inception, how you put some things together. Well, with Cold Case um, BC, it was kind of a lot of the, the research I get from the cases came to me. After Cold Case Vancouver came out, you know, I talked about sort of dealing with a lot of the families and getting to know them and things like that. It felt really weird just to walk away. Um, these were cases that I'd chosen that were really little known, um, hadn't been talked about or heard about decades and even at the time that often just a few newspaper clippings. So it was great to get them out in the book and great to get some publicity for them. Um, but I just didn't want to leave it there. So I set up a, a Facebook page called at that time Cold Case Vancouver. And really is a way to just remember the victims and with any like, you know, tell us more information. Um, because a lot of the cases I wrote were way before 1996 when DNA first came out on the scene. Uh, and in those days, police weren't always very contentious. It got contaminated, it got lost, it got thrown out. Uh, so in most of these cases, there's very little there, uh, and we're not going to solve it through genealogy or stuff like that. Uh, so really the only way I think going to be solved is if someone comes forward with new information that might help police. So by putting them out on the page, I thought, you know, not only does it sound somewhere to talk about them, remember them, but with a, in a best case scenario, someone might come forward with new information that can help. But what I found out was I was flooded with cases from people, from family members and things like that, that wanted um, their own family members or friends teachers or, or whoever uh, remembered and so I'm going to do that and suddenly I've got hundreds and hundreds of it's just frightening how many unsolved murders there are and then I started with missing people cases particularly missing children which is particularly heartbreaking and so I started the page and every now and then I call case would get solved very often but occasionally it does and I wanted to close in as well. So that all really got translated in, into Cold Case BC. It's really one third unsolved murders, one third solved, and one third missing people. And a lot of the cases just came to me. Um, as far as research after that, with these older cases, it's brilliant because, if it's, you know, for research purposes, before 1970, the inquests were all available through BC archives and they're expensive. But you have just 
wealth of information that's really never been seen before. Uh, so that's been really, really effective. Uh, finding people and getting back to Facebook, wow, that's just been a huge breakthrough. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes I can find myself, in, you know, in, in, in three minutes, I'm like, oh, my God, that's too easy. Where's the fun in that chat? Um, whereas before you'd be at the library and the microfilm and, and, and doing all that stuff, Newspapers.com came on the scene two years ago and completely changed everything. You know, where we'd have to go to the Vancouver Library and they actually had, they probably still do, but they had murder files, cabinets, and cabinets of murder files with all the clippings. So I'd go through those, spend a few, you know, days every week uh, going through the files, seeing what was there that, that was back when I was conference in Vancouver and going through the mic which all of us who have done that know that after two hours of that, you sort of shoot yourself in that head. It's just hideous. And then com just revolutionised all of that. So that, that's just been brilliant as a starting point. But usually once I connect with the families, I find so much of the original information is just wrong. It's got repeated and repeated over and over again. So it also gives me a chance to correct that and tell the proper stories. It's uh, just to reflect on the newspaper doctrine, because I had a funny conversation with you about it. But for, prior to this, just to explain to those of you who maybe are not researchers or, or haven't done that kind of thing, at the top floor of the Vancouver Public Library, there are newspapers on microfiche, and various newspapers, Province Sun, Georgia Strait, uh, whatnot, and you can go through those and you can search for things. But it's basically like you've been given every newspaper since time immortal and find the one that you're looking for, you know, and you can't search microfiche, but with the advent of newspaper.com, you can now keyword search a name yourself even, uh, and, uh, and find those issues, uh, you know, and, and they come up on your screen. You can do it in the privacy of your own home in your pajamas uh, and, uh, and do that work. I, I, when I was working on the Commodore Ballroom book, I, I went through every issue of the Georgia Strait going back to 1973 to copy the entertainment listing on microfiche so I could do those archives. And it was like it, it was like making the Great Wall of China with pieces of Lego. It, it, it took years. People were, when I told them what I was doing, they were astonished. Like, what, uh, you need professional help if you're gonna take on some a project. But it, it eventually, and that built the show archive for every night of shows, every concert, going back to 1973 and then some up until 2015, when, when it's, we sort of stopped. We're gonna actually just reactivate it. Um, but that was a tremendous, uh, change because now you could, if you knew something happened in the you know August 1967, you could at least look through 30 days of newspapers and find something. But that's where now you just type in the subject or the person or the name you're looking for or whatever keywords it might help. And now you can find those very newspaper issues. And I remember joking with you at the time, thinking, "Geez, are we out of a job?" Uh, you know, like it felt like suddenly the, 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 anybody can do it, and you, and you can. But of course. You still, you still need somebody to tell the story, and still, and that's hopefully where. Nerdy. Yes. You know, I remember us all, and I think Jesse Donaldson. We're all sitting in the London Hotel having a beer one night, and I can't remember what we got in the discussion about, but it was some historical fact, and it was like, oh no, it's ten to nine, we can't make the library. Who else would? <laughs> we, can check it all <laughs> we can all do it. A game before news. Oh, now we, I guess, we can find that out. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's true. And it certainly, certainly changed uh, and, yeah. and made our best, I think. Yeah. Never, I like, need this, you know, like, or, or we just didn't find that issue at the time. But now it's, yeah. now we find out so much more. But I think you're right, you know, when you talk about connecting with the story, and I, I'm doing um, was a panel at Whistler Writers Festival next month, and I have to write a blog about connecting with story. And I was just thinking about that yesterday and how I do that. And a lot of it, I, I used the, um, in Talk SBC, I wrote about um, the missing women and uh, murdered Indigenous women up north, three cases. And because I was absolutely staggered when I read the statistics, there was something like over 1,300 missing and murdered women across Canada, unsolved. And, and that to me is just staggering. 26% of that, more than a quarter of all these cases, are in BC. Like, this is a national tragedy, and we just don't seem to be seeing about it. But it's just a statistic. 
until you start putting a face and a story to that statistic, it doesn't connect people. And I think that's, when I was thinking through that, using that as an example, I think that's what I, I'm trying to do here. I'm taking those statistics and that horror and trying to put a human face to it and tell these people's stories and hopefully make people care. And, you know, in a perfect world, bring about some change because we're seeing all these inquiries and it goes on and on and on, but nothing ever seems to change. Yeah. That leads me to uh, the issue of police transparency, if we could talk about that. Uh, okay. even. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, and everybody would understand that you know, the police have to keep, especially an active investigation or something that's that, that still open, that's not, that is a cold case still, they have to keep some facts themselves to be able to, if somebody comes forward and says they've done it, maybe they're just reciting the facts they saw in the papers or something, you know, somebody off the rocker, something like this. And, and the police are obviously, especially in Canada, uh, because of privacy issues. I want to maybe put that in italics, if I can, if you're in your mind when, I'm, when I say that phrase. Um, uh, uh, that seems to be an overriding thing of, of accessing information. It's very difficult to get any, if anybody's filed a freedom of information request with Vancouver Police Department, um, you, yeah, you, you, you know, you can ask some very specific questions, um, and you maybe get a page or something, if that, uh, so, you know, they can, might, which you can appeal and sometimes you can get more, but yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that or how it was, oh, I can speak to that too, but I, I want to hear from you first. Yeah. That was one of the biggest challenges and continues to be in writing about um, unsolved murders, missing people slightly better, not much. Um, and it is a real problem, especially with old cases. Um, my last FOI I put through was, I was talking about the Paul's murder, a triple murder in 58. Still unsolved, uh, pretty much nothing's been done, it probably hasn't been done for decades. And so I, I filed an FOI, it said, turned down, I filed another one saying, so much time's gone by. They refused again because of there could be family members still alive that yes. might be affected. You would think family members would want answers, but, or at least to know that into these cases. It just seems to me a really effective way of shutting us down in the media and stopping information getting out, um, because we know a lot of these cases aren't being looked at. It's sitting in, in banker boxes all around the province in RCMP storage lockers gathering dust. They haven't been looked at for years and years and won't be looked at until something comes up. And I know this because I get an answer. It's like, you know, it's, it's, they're not digitized. They're just not being looked at. And I think, you know, what you were saying as well, and what, what we don't want is police to give back, hold back evidence, hold back being maybe it was a method of murder, maybe it was um, a bite mark, maybe it was something that uh, they could use in a Mr. Big Sting later on or they ever do catch the, the suspect, they can use that to uh, make sure that he's the top one. We don't want that. In no way do we want to get in the way of investigation. We want these cases solved. But there's a lot of information that they could be providing that we could get out that could bring in more information. And, you know, the lack of transparency, particularly by the RCMP, I asked, uh, I, I told you about this, you know, uh, missing children and missing missing people in general figures are put out by the RCMP every year, and they're staggeringly ridiculous. Um, Twenty eight thousand or something in a year. Now this includes people that uh, oh hello, my husband's late home for dinner. He's gone missing. Oh okay, he's a sad. Um, to my teenage son, didn't come home last night. He's probably his girlfriend. Okay, that's the number. To um, my three year old. Balcony 10 years ago and it's been missing, it's been abducted. That's all included there. So I was trying to get some clarification about that. Who's actually missing? You know, I, who's missing after, say, a year or, or some fundamental thing? Um, and who's likely not to have chosen to go missing or, you know, drowned in a boat accident or, or whatever? People have been abducted and you can't get that information. And, and I got this email back saying, you know, well, we need to know all this stuff about you. His public, and I've sent the publisher information, but we need to know more about this. He's signing the licensing agreement on my behalf. 
I had to write back and say, I'm trying to clarify publicly available statistics, not writing a, you know, a book about the RCMP or you know, making them into a cartoon or something. I'm not doing that. And they wouldn't provide any context at all until I found one very brave officer who, who was able to sort of walk me through it and, and tell me that they were completely ridiculous, these numbers. So, you know, we've seen Chelsea Foreman, I think we were chatting about her case the other night. She was a young Indigenous woman who went missing two years ago and then was found in a Shaughnessy property. The VPD did a big press conference. They say, we, we don't know the cause of death, but we believe it's undetermined. And it was kind of case closed. And, of course, the family were horrified by saying, you know, how can you close the case if you, you know, and say it was no foul play if you don't know how she was murdered? Uh, how can you do that? And I, I think it's technically open. But again, you know, they're not providing information because it's technically an unsolved case. Yeah, and and so often is the case that you sometimes only get any information by connecting with an officer, active or retired, who has who most often retired, who uh, who maybe shed some light uh, on something. Um, I, um, when I was working on Vancouver Vice, which was my last book, um, I was, I'd been interviewing a number of um, Vancouver police officers who had worked on the Vice Squad. We don't, we don't actually have a Vice Squad anymore in, in Vancouver, which is even more interesting. And, well, there we go. Yeah, we're the only ones working these things now, apparently. Um, uh, but I've been interviewing some, some officers, and, I, and there's, a, there's a murder that happened in the West End in 1984 that, uh, that I looked specifically we wanted to look into and I happened to be speaking to a retired officer uh, and I said uh, he'd actually just retired within that year I guess and I said look I'm trying to I'm going to file this FOI request so if you don't want to tell me anything that's fine but I, I would sort of like to know so often is the case when you file a freedom of immigration it's you, you're only getting the answers to the questions you ask and how specifically you ask may be the difference of getting an answer or not so I said, I'm just hoping to get something, if I can ask some more specific, I don't know what's in the file. And he goes, well, let me pull it for you. And I thought, well, you're, you're retired. How, how are you going to do that? And, and, and he's got some friends in the department. He still looks something up. And uh, he called me a few days later. And I said, well, I got the file right here. And, when he started, and I record my telephone calls. Uh, so I, I just let him read the thing out, which was great. Suddenly I had the whole file without an FOI request, basically. And I said, I'd like to... He was describing some photos, some crime scene photos, and I said, "What? Geez, I, I still like to see these pictures. I don't know, you know." And he goes, "And this was just when COVID had started. Everything was shut down." He goes, "Where? You want to meet somewhere?" And I thought, "Well, everything's kind of closed. There's no coffee shop in my immediate area." And I lived down at the east end of False Creek by the train station down there. He goes, and I said, "Well, I'll meet you at the train station." It felt like a spy meeting. I was showing up, and I said, "Well, I'll open my umbrella in the train station. That, that'll be me because we hadn't met in person before. We just knew each other through kind of reputation or." or through the books and I knew I was aware of him. But he let me look at everything and he and I, I said, can I take a picture of this just for reference? Yeah, it's okay. And uh uh you know I, I didn't say that I got that information from him or anything like that. But then when I filed my FOI my report and it, all the specific stuff I asked for almost I was able to say I want this on page five and this on page ten. And I think the people down at FOI at the Vancouver Pri uh, police privacy office thought where where have you seen in fact they did ask you know, it sounds like you've got some of this information already. And I go, well, I spoke to a retired officer who worked on the case. He's passed away now. His family uh, has some stuff, and they showed it to me, which was a lie. And I didn't want to get the guy. I knew it. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, this the book's out now, so I got nothing to worry about. Um, and I, but I, and that's something, I think in my case, especially in my case, almost, maybe more just because uh, over the course of, of, of the Vector Vice and also the book I wrote on the history of the Penthouse Nightclub, and the raid there, the, the, the vice squad in 1975, and, and over the course of years, um, I was able to somewhat cultivate uh, a reputation with, with quite a few Vancouver retired Vancouver Police Department people that were that uh, they sort of saw where I was coming from and felt that it was I was okay to talk to. And it's interesting when you do speak to some of those retired guys. Sometimes they don't want to talk at all because either the stuff they saw on the job just ate at them, and they that's the past for them now, or they were looked over for some promotion. And as soon as they quit, quit the job, all they care about is their pension. I'd hate to have a job like that. You worked for 25, 30 years, and you never want to think about it again. Or you're retired with some animosity or sour grapes or whatever. It's an awful prison to be in. You know, like. But then you do get people who do 
they would like the job, still like talking about it and whatnot, and, and they still think about it, they dream about it, you know, and whatnot. And if you're asking the right questions and you come with the right respect and, and they see where you come from, you can get them to, to, to open up. And, um, you know, even I, uh, even I are, are what I, I refer to uh, as members of the Belshaw gang, uh, and uh, Tom Carter, another one of our gang affiliates here, uh, uh, it was a term that I came up with, uh, in regards to Vancouver Noir and John Belshaw, and it should be the, the Belshaw Pervy Gang, actually, but uh, John Belshaw, one of the co-authors of Vancouver Noir, which I thought at the time was a, kind of a, came at a crucial crossroads, that book. Um, in my mind, people like our, ourselves and Tom and, and probably 10 other people in town, you would be probably, because of our output, probably a, more, a little bit more visible, you even more so. Uh, thanks to the podcast and everything like that. People don't know who I am. They know who you are. Um, they, uh, there's, been this, uh, there's been an interesting sort of renaissance in the last 10, 15 years in terms of books about Vancouver, not just crime, entertainment history, different, uh, different histories of the city, that there's never been a, a, a better period, me, of books and material and new people working on, on the subject of, of some of this stuff. And that's been really interesting to see. I think people will look back on this period and they will hope to refer to the Belshaw gang, uh, like a group of seven or something like that. That's how I think of it. When, I, when I go to bed. Like, anyway, sure. And st- hopefully still on the shelves, yeah. And sometimes I- I- in our work, uh, we've crossed over uh, uh, in some stuff. There's a case. Can you talk about the Alley murders uh, in that sense uh, and, and a little bit about that, if, if you can? I was just thinking that um, when you're talking about retired police officers, because yeah. it's kind of a cliche when you hear, you know, one there was a case that they didn't solve that keeps them up at night. But there is, yeah. it seems to be there is. And I guess that's why they're so keen to talk about us. And I guess they trust us. It's great. Um, but, but just to get that, that information out. And one of them was the Alley murders. Now, I'd never heard of this. I read a little bit about it, but to me, that this is completely new territory, and I was supposed to. One, like, right. You opened up, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and it was from Lisa Gavin. And she was uh, Lisa Gavin, and um, oh, name's gone. Jerry? No. Ruth. No, no, the other, the other lady. Other was with the friend. Yeah. Oh, anyway, yeah. it'll come back in a second. Um, there were two relatives that were murdered, uh, young women, sex workers, in the late eighteen. 18- 1980s, and um, the VPD put up on their court case website last year, and the family got quite excited because they thought, you know, they're looking into the murder of their loved ones again, and, and that was all great. And I'd put it on the Facebook page, Lisa Gunn was the first one, and a detective I know called me and said, um, that was part of the alley murders, we solved that. And the killer, it was a serial killer, and six cases died. And I said, what? Why is it up on the court case site then? I mean, you know, there are hundreds, thousands of cases. Then why, why would they put that one up? So that was a bit of a mystery. And I got hold of another detective that I work with, a retired detective on a number of these cases. And he'd worked on not Lisa's case, but um, the other young woman in 1980. And then he was part of this task force, this RCMP task force that was put together around 2005 to reinvestigate. And Alex, the detective, had been brought in on the missing women's file, Robert Picton's case. And uh, then she was brought in to, to pull the DNA from a lot of the, the missing women. And it turned out that they, that they had six sex workers. They found two at DNA on Lisa Gavins and another of the sex workers bodies, they found the body of another murdered woman behind the suspect's house in his garage, uh, and the other three were connected through place and social connections and things. But they were definite for they were being murdered by the same person. So the Crown decided, because in BC, and I feel for the police in this, the police can't press charges, the Crown has to press charges. We've seen this now all the time with catch and release, and must be so frustrating, you know, beats up someone 10 times a week, keep getting let out, let out, let out. And um, so the Crown, even when the detectives 
this to the crown, DNA to the bodies of the suspect and the body behind his house in a shed, naked, um, all with cocaine. He was a cocaine dealer. In their systems, uh, they refused to push it forward. They said, we need more evidence. So they followed, they had him, they followed the guy, they got this, they already had his DNA, they had compared and got it. And they followed him around 24 hours because they were scared he was going to birth someone else. And in the end, they, they pulled him in and tried to get him to and he wouldn't. And he was quite ill. He died without a confession. So they basically kept the cases unsolved. They call resolved. Now, we know who did it. If I remember correctly, they even went to his deathbed. Yes. And, and, and said, oh, yes. Dr. Chester. Yeah. yeah, and so what we think must have happened is that the, the task force went ahead, but it was led by the RCP. It's a different file. It's on a different computer system that the VPD used. And what the detectives think is that it was just a screw up. It never got the memo, never got down that they'd had the guy. And the VPD still have these cases up. The detectives went on my podcast because they wanted the VPD. I mean, to issue a press release and say, hey, we found this. And it was particularly heartbreaking because the foster sister, Lisa Gavin, has been pushing for answers for over 34 years, has been told nothing, was never told that he was a suspect, um, never told, you know, he, he died, and thought that this guy was walking around, you know, living his life while his sister had been murdered. So after the podcast, after I had everything in place, and I got the podcast out. I, I called her and I said, Sharon, you need to listen to this and then you'll want to call me and, and talk it through. And she was just absolutely devastated. Called a meeting with the BBD and they said, well, you know, we didn't get a confession. There may have been someone else involved, um, yada, yada, yada. But they couldn't, you know, they didn't tell her any of this. And I just find that so incredibly upsetting and so unethical. You know, don't tell the media, but at least tell the families that this guy is no longer walking around. Yeah, well, yeah, and I, and I, dare I say, you and I, we have probably talked more with that cousin. Your name, now. Sure. That's it. Pardon me. Yes, uh, yes Foster said, Pardon me. That's right. And we've talked to her more than the law enforcement. And I had originally written about Lisa Gavin because she was the sister um, of a Clark Park gang member. Um, Biological grandmother, uh, Ruth Gavin, was one of the biggest heroin dealers. Fascinating criminal subject in, in town in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but, uh, uh, and I had written about that then and sort of connected with you writing about this. Her so name suddenly kind of appeared again. I think that's how Sharon reached out to us. And as I said, I think she, we've talked to her more than, than the VPD. Even if they, they, the VPD wouldn't have had anything fresh. I don't mean to knock the VPD. Everybody I deal with there is great. I realize some of the hurdles they have, but in many situations, it feels like that just by being a little bit more open, saying, look, this is what we pretty much think is happening, and at least to give that person or the family some evidence. You know, we're not going to be looking at that this much more because of this. We can't prove it, but all our instincts, and this is the reason why we feel this way, you know, in this case, it would be the, 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 the family sort of left hanging, you know, doesn't hear anything. Uh, and unless people like ourselves sometimes shake a few coconuts from the tree, if you will, you know, some information for them to, for them to, to uh, and get by. I want to um, want to talk about maybe what you're working on coming up next, or any future talks or given. You mentioned Whistler, but I wanted to open up with just the time we have since we got well, we got 50 minutes. Yeah, uh, just for some time for questions. If anybody has it, whether you're a reader or a writer or a researcher or if you're interested in the subject, or if you're not familiar with these books, or you totally are, or uh, what, what not? If anybody, I want to leave that open. Anyway, go right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you for your your work already. Yeah. I have some questions for you. Later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Leave us your card. We're going to talk to you right after. Oh, geez. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
don't have a library card in the Toronto Public Library, do you? Sorry. You don't have a Toronto Public Library card, do you? I've just put this out on my page. Um, just quickly, I'm, my new book is um, about the Empress of Ireland, and it was a ship that sank in 1914 off the coast of Mooski. Now, more passengers died on that ship that night than died on the Titanic. But has anyone heard of it, by the way? Yeah, you don't count. I've had coffee with. Count. I've had coffee with both of them. Told them all about it. <laughs> so, well, before talking to me, has anyone heard about it, uh, uh, Tom? What, uh, and I did this at the um, Vancouver Historical Society to about 80 people, and I thought, oh, lots of people will know about that one person put up their hand. Um, but it's been interesting because I've been working with archives, but my frustration now is that I'm trying to get some uh, clips from the Toronto News. Toronto Star News Daily or something like that, and it's only through the Toronto Public Library, and I have to have a card, but I have to live there to get the card. Uh, so I've been putting out these frantic things. If anyone lives in Toronto and has a library card, because they loan me the number for a day. And I'll... <laughs> and... Oh, okay, thank you. Um, but I've been going for that book, particularly I've been going through different archives looking for old newspapers that haven't been digitised. And interesting enough, Tom, we we're chasing an origin survivor of one of the um, origin story, rather, of one of the survivors. And again, it's 1914, everyone's long dead. And uh, a lot of the stories were just wrong and ended up tracing the family. And they had an original uh, letter talking about this guy's survival story, which was completely different from everything that was in the paper. And they traced it back to a local journal union. Uh, Ontario, it's a tiny little town of three people, feels like, a few farms. And um, they had uh, Tom, um, Tom, who's the best researcher in the world, and just said, Tom, any idea? Because it was ripped, we could only see, I think, V and AL or something at the end. Yeah. So, so Tom loves the challenge, and, and it turned out he found out it was a this Thomas, St. Thomas Journal in, in the middle of nowhere in 1914. And I was able to go through the archives and, get, and they were fabulous. They went and traced down the original story. And um, I just did that again last week with Merritt. I was looking for another survivor, John um, Langley. And I'd had, you know, I finally got hold of his grandchild, tracing him through various things over the years. He was about two streets away from <laughs> as these weird things happen. Uh, but the archivists were able to dig up all these you know, tiny little newspapers on out of print that, that had actual news with him. So it's magical. So in that way, yeah, love you guys. Janet Smith. Well, <laughs> I'm <laughs> Right. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah to add, that's literally where I think um, uh, where we all first start is, is going to be with any kind of archive, whether it's BC, Vancouver archive, whatever it is. Um, sometimes the subject matter that we're delving into, there are, are no archive material about it, and we're the ones finding it, maybe, or, or creating it for the first time, you know. Um, but it's still where you start. And whether you're some, whether you're somebody in investigating cold cases or investigating the history of some Vancouver nightclubs, or you're a house researcher and you're trying to find out when your home was built uh, in Strathcona or, or any of these things, it's always going to be your first stop. And and the people, if you, I, I, for those of you who've never been to the uh, 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 BC archives or Vancouver archives, uh, you know, that bunker-like building out by the, the planetarium uh, there, the piece of Vancouver archives, maybe you're sort of nervous to ask one of the very sort of bookish 
uh, people who were working there with their head down, you know. Uh, when, but these people are ultimately very friendly and and uh, and ready to help. And, and actually, will, in many cases, if they kind of interested in what you're working on, they'll stop what they're working on just to help you, uh, you know. So, and and the amazing thing is, with any of this archival material, it's yours. Your tax dollars paid for. It. It's for it's free to you. You can look it up and and uh, you know. And, some of these Facebook groups, uh, these nostalgia pages and whatnot, people produce these pictures and uh, share these things, and they sort of make it, they sort of pass it off as their own. And people say, "Oh, this is amazing! You have so many great photos," and they don't say, "Well, you're getting it from the Vancouver Archive. I can find this stuff for you." You know, like, and people say, "Can you find this for me?" And, and they don't. They're just finding photos. So sometimes people pass these things off as their own when it's not. It's yours. You know, your 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 tax dollars paper, and it's helping people like you that uh, that help us find stuff. And that's always going to be the first first uh, place to go you know then you, you sometimes will go will go out from there or whatnot of course but, uh, but ultimately as i say whether you're doing anything any kind of research or you're curious about uh you know a time period or a place or a person it's going to be you know and the fact that so much of that is online now uh i'm a i'm a board member on the friend of the vancouver archives uh as is tom carter here um and we're trying to fundraise uh for the archives because especially in the case of more recently the whole archive of the Vancouver Sun and Province photo archives, which I think are some 2 million images in total, photographs, these are people who appear in newspapers, your, our history, places, people, uh, whatnot, incidents. Um, at the present rate, with only maybe two people scanning, it's going to take 80 years to get those all into digitized content that can be looked up and found. Um, it's Tom and I's and a few other people's goal. And even if we could half that to 40 years, that would be nice by being able to fundraise some money and get some more archive down there. But, uh, you know, if you're curious, get involved, uh, go check things out. There's so much fun stuff you can find. I was down in the archives one time, and I just pulled something off the shelf. I just picked out a random card and microfiche, and I put it on the thing and looked at it. And I found the most amazing stuff. And I ate it the next two weeks of my life that I didn't have uh, time to, to go to. Um, and whatnot. Um, next, let's show, jump to the question. Here, um, I don't know if we've got more serial killers than anybody else. I think we have more opportunity, especially when you're looking at the northern cases. Um, there's so much opportunity for predators. And it's just like this incredible hunting ground. You've got uh, a lot of really destitute indigenous people that have to get from A to B when there's no transport, little cell phone reception, or they have to hitchhike. And I don't think that's changed very much. I think they've put some street lights up. Um, uh, they've changed a bit of cell phone coverage and things like that. But I don't think the bus systems are much better than they ever were. It's... Well, it could be anybody. It could be truckers, it could be tourists, it could be locals, it could be, you know, opportunity, it could be predators just preying on these people. You don't uh, have to be up north. You look, you look you know, right down to Vancouver. Happened. And the valley, it, you've got the valley murders, a group of serial killers in the 80s, you've got the alley murder killer, the serial killer that was just killing sex workers. And, and I guess sex workers too, are, you know, Easy, no one, you know, at least don't really bother too much. So, again, it's okay. Well, I don't, it, much, in many cases, I don't think it would bother that much. I think in many cases, you're, you're dealing with a situation that these people are in very vulnerable lives and, and are easy targets. I hate to say, you know, certainly the cases can be made in the case of the victim case and even in the Green River Killer case when they let the information out to the public that these victims were sex workers. The public tended to think, well, they're they got what's coming to them, They're leading lives that are, you know, which is a terrible thing. But that was, a, yeah, for sure, yeah. It, it, in the, I, the one question I asked you on another time that we got together, Eve, in the wake of Cold Case BC, are there any cases in there that you think will be solvable or, 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 or maybe brought, to, now maybe even brought to the forefront in your book? Or is there something that's just hinging on solved with the right information? Or do you think, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it was funny. When this, um, when Cold Case Vancouver came out, you know, I'd really hope that we'd see oh, a whole bunch of solved cases. And, of course, we didn't. Uh, the only one that really came to 
most of that was babes in the woods and they were the, the two little boys that were found in Stanley Park in 1953 and for decades it's been during Vancouver mystery story and there was really not much hope that, that would ever be solved and part of the problem was that the bones were on display for god's sake at the Vancouver Police Museum for years and, and then through the DNA. And then Brian Honeyburn at one point cremated a lot of the under the radar. Uh, so there are only very few bone fragments left of it and very difficult to get the genome sequencing that they need to put through GEDmatch and the genealogical databases in the States. But they ended up amazingly, they, they got enough DNA from the older boy to be able to, to do that and put it through and identify the two boys as uh, David and Derek D'Alton. And, and that was just incredible. They still haven't identified the younger one. I don't know if they've got DNA, probably not. So we don't know anything about the fathers and we don't know who murdered them, although the police have kind of thrown the mother under the bus on, on that one. But that was absolutely amazing. One of the reasons why I wanted to do um, a 30 book solved so we could talk about the police investigation and, you know, I, I don't, again, it's, um, I mean, it's just crushing to read unsolved case after unsolved case, but it also looks like the police aren't doing their job. And I, I certainly didn't want to leave that impression um, because they are in many, many yeah. cases. When they solve these cold cases, it's so fascinating, either through the Mr. Big things where they solved um, 12-year-old Monica Jack's case and uh, Gladys Wakabashi's case and, um, and through the genetic genealogy, getting the babes in the woods and names back and solving uh, two of the teenagers from, from Washington State. Uh, it's quite amazing. It, we'll be sticking around for a little bit. Even if you have a few minutes, just in case people want to ask something privately or come up or anything like that, you're more than welcome to me as well. Um, Eve, wh where are you appearing next? Uh, we can find you on your on social media. We can find it, but you've got a podcast. And uh, can you talk a little, bit, a little bit about that and the blog, of course? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, I do a blog, I've taken a break from that now, I'm doing a new book, but it's called Every Place Has a Story and there's tons of back information. I actually turned that blog into a book called Vancouver Exposed a couple of years ago. Uh, do a podcast that um, initially came out of this and it's called Cold Case Canada. The first two seasons are uh, Vancouver and the second are Cold Case BC. And what I love about that is you can hear the voices, you can hear these retired homicide detectives Detectives talk about how difficult it was and, and the investigation. You can hear the family members talking about what they went through. You can hear from gene, uh, genetic genealogists like Cece Moore, um, the coroners, like Rose Edgen. Um, and I love that. I love having their voices. You know, it's really important. And um, my next gig, I'll be doing the Whistler Writers on a crime panel on October 17th, I think. Good stuff. Um, and for myself, uh, you can certainly find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and uh, whatnot. I'm easy enough to track down. Um, I've done many of these talks with Eve. I think we've done maybe three of these just with you. Or the book launch first, and then we did something last year. Did last year. So, uh, and I was speaking at a Makeover History event, and this woman said, uh, well, how come I've never heard of you before? I've heard of Eve Lazarus. And I thought, okay, this is the last time I'm going to host an Eve thing. Get somebody else doing it. I got to get a piece of the pie myself here eventually. No, I'm 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 very happy to um, uh, to do this with you, Eve, as always. And, and it's it's always a pleasure to hang out uh, and chat. And uh, it's been amazing to see the success of Cold Case BC. I think there maybe your most successful book in terms of book sales uh, and, and number one on the BC Best Sellers list. Once I I I, I jinxed it before. But I'm going to put my foot down I'm at the BC Book Prizes. If this doesn't win the Bill Tuffy Book Choice Award, I'm going to overturn the tables like uh, Jesus doing upsetting the moneylenders in the, in the church at that time. Because I think you're I think you're due for it. And that and this book in, in particular has captured uh, public's imagination uh, so much. And it's interesting the question that you know, when we talk about how geez, why do we have this so much so many serial killers have this crime? And think about it, we don't. The crime statistics of British Columbia are not crime statistics of Baltimore, Maryland, or Houston, or you know, there's many. There's a, there's a certain fear out there, and and it, when you see some of the crime incidents or stabbing that happen in China and any of these things, it's easy to think, oh my God, I don't want to pay an in for the weekend. I'm not going, you know. Um, but this is a fairly peaceful place for all intents and purposes. There's always a dark underbelly, 
it, there was even one in Carisdale growing up, and I, I was certain of it. But it's interesting that, that uh, true crime has sort of captured Vancouverites' imagination in, in a way that's just as legitimate as everywhere else. Um, and, uh, and hopefully for all the right reasons. Uh, with your book, and I hope, uh, I do hope something gets solved, that something can, we'll turn back and somebody says, well, Eve Lazarus wrote about that uh, in, in Cold Creek, BC. So I hope, uh, I, I hope, and you never know, you never know what what will happen next. Um, I'm going to be at the Rody House Museum in the West End on September 22nd, uh, talking about, a little bit about my book, Vancouver Vice. I'm going to talk specifically about the crime history of the West End, um, as well as the Bachelor Murders, uh, which uh, uh, my friend Tom Crowder helped me investigate, and I go into here as well as um, the strange figure of uh, and murder of Wayne Harris, whose body was found in the trunk of a car in Stanley Park, just off Lost Lagoon on May first, nineteen uh, nineteen eighty four. So, if, I think there's a handful of tickets left. Come to that if you want to uh, hear me uh, blab on about uh, about that. Uh, do check out any, some more Word Vancouver stuff. Uh, follow the we're Vancouver social media pages. I think it's one of the best literary festivals uh, in the city, specifically because it focuses on Vancouver writers. I, I love the Vancouver Writers Fest, all power to them, but so much of it is international people coming in, and it's not Vancouver stories being told. That's my one jab at the Vancouver Writers Festival that I won't wish they, they had more of. Um, but this festival abounds with it. In fact, it's all it's about. Uh, and I in the spirit of localism and local stories and local history, uh, this is this one's aces for me. And it, as always, aces hanging out with you here. Aces. Yeah, cool. Um, we'll be hanging around uh, a little bit if you wanted to chat or if you had a question or anything like that. Thank you very much for coming. Do check out some more Word Vancouver stuff and we'll see you around. Cheers.